screenshot.
video on here. Plus video. Oh wait, this is to that's not to take a video. Is this add to my story? Is that what I do? Yeah. You can swipe over to live. And that has to go that way, right? Because it doesn't go. say there's gonna Instagram. Matt and, Matt and Sam. Dude, Sam, you're right here. Oh, and Joe. Yeah. Uh, 
into a garden. Really, guys? Really? <laughs> He's just wearing a really beige shirt. It showed you like crawling across the side oh. to try to hide. <laughs> You're on, dude. Okay. I, do, I need to sit over here on that. Okay. All right. I want to tell you, this is a first for me. <laughs> All right. Good morning, church family. Um, happy Resurrection Day. Is I'm so excited uh, to be able to gather with you uh, today. I know it's not ideal. But, um, we've, we've been saying it all week, the church building may be empty, but so is the tomb, and that's what we're celebrating today. And I'm so excited, like I said, to uh, be able to be with you, even though we're not physically together, um, we're blanketing this valley uh, from each of our homes with praise for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is risen today. He is risen indeed, is he not? Um, I'm going to give you the rundown today of how things are going to go, and um, I really hope that, um, that you guys are excited and that you'll just raise your voices in your hands today in praise and worship for our Lord, and um, that uh, I pray that... that the Lord would speak to you through Julian and through our worship today, uh, just as he does every Sunday, even in church. And so, yeah, it, it, it's, I, I, I haven't got the words, you guys. I'm so excited. So, all right. So, uh, first of all, if you would like for someone to get in touch with you, um, if you've got something on your mind, if you're carrying a burden, we really want to reach out to you. We want to be there with you. We want to pray with you. Um, please send a text to 406-381-4314 or send, um, send a Facebook message to the Roots page um, if you can. Um, again, that number is 406-381-4314. Um, I'm going to open, it, uh, open this up in prayer and then um, as uh, we always do, Julian and the worship team are going to come and um, lead us in worship. And again, like I said, I, just, I hope that you'll raise your voices in your hands in praise for, um, for what the Lord has done for us. Um, and then he's going to deliver his message. And then Matt, in um, of course our super ultra high-tech fashion, is going to, to have something for you. And then um, my beautiful wife, Michelle, is going to um, have a little Sunday school bit for uh, the kids. And so um, we've got 
just a lot of awesome stuff going today, and um, I'm so glad that you're with us. And let's let's um, before we do pray, I, I just want to read to you from um, Ephesians uh, one verses three through twelve. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his, his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have so much praise and worship and love for you today, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Um, Father, there is no way for us to express to you how thankful we are that you loved us so much that you would give your only Son uh, to pay the price for our sins, God. Um, and to, uh, to make it possible for us to be your children. And Lord, as we celebrate this day, I pray, Father God, that you would speak to each one of us, that we would seek you, Lord, um, and give you all of the praise and worship of our hearts, God. You are an amazing God. There is no one like you, Lord, and we give this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we'll have to start off the customary, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to Imagine that you're yelling it back at me. So he is risen. He is risen indeed. Wow, guys, we could say it louder. <laughs> My own kids are like, ah. Oh. So he is risen. He is risen indeed.
Father, we just thank you again for this morning and Yeah, Lord, I, as we were talking about last night, even in our own home, um, through the little winter squall and storm that we had here to be able to wake up and, and truly remember, Lord, that um, you've made us white as snow, not because of anything that we've ever tried to accomplish or put together or plan or some procedure, but simply just because of your great love for us. And so this morning, Lord, we, we want to be able to celebrate that life that you've given to each one of us, Lord. And so um, we ask your hand of, of care and blessing upon the Sunday school activities and what that will look like, Lord, through us looking at a section of scripture that maybe many of us know or have heard many times, Lord, giving us new insight to that. We just thank you again for your goodness, Lord. Thank you so much for your grace. We ask that you'd be blessed and that you'd be glorified. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, while you're at home, handshake, high five, hug, holy kiss, secret note. We will be back in two minutes. I wish you could all see how many people are going, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> all her kids shushing each other. So we're going to do it one more time because I know my mom is watching and she will chastise me if we don't. So he is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. Nicely done. All right. Well, um, welcome everybody again to this very different Resurrection Sunday. Um, if you want to grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 20, that's what we're going to be going over here this morning. And it all kind of started, you know, Again, I love this section, and especially of all the the gospel sections of the resurrection, this probably is one of my favorites. And the reason, again, being is because it, it is very, very real. Um, and I think there is a, a reality to, as we look at this this morning, the resurrection, there should be a reality. You know, um, last this last summer, the kids and I, with my wife, we went to go visit my mom and as we're in California, you know, we always make our way over to Santa Cruz and we were in Santa Cruz and 
the whole time we were there, we were admiring this grass that was off in the distance. And we were like, wow, it's so cut, so manicured, so green. We don't have grass like that, you know, here ever. And so finally, we walked over to go, you know, look and see what kind of grass it was. And we realized it was fake. And instantly, all, all of the things that we've been thinking about that grass was instantly thrown out the window because it was fake. And so, you know, I think there's many times where we sort of walk through what we think church is. Again, and I think God is teaching us church is not a building at all. Thank the Lord that it's a, a body of, of believers that are gathered together. I think there is sometimes can be a fakeness over the reality of what the resurrection is and ex exactly what it means. And, and here's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at this and an aspect of, you know, we're going to look at a few different people's aspects, but especially Mary's. And the thought that always goes through my mind as I read through this section is the what if. And I don't know if you've ever had that thought where you started thinking, what if, you know, what if I, what if I was smarter? What if I was taller? What if I, you know, had a different job? What if I had a different family? What if I had a different, you know, the main three house spouse or blouse, you know, what if I had those sort of things? Um, would things have been different? And we can get sometimes so caught into the whole of where we sort of led our life that we think we're, we're either too far gone for God to, to make a move and to change us or that there really is no hope. And what I want to share this morning, hopefully will give you the same hope that it gives me continually in looking at this fresh start. Because although there was death there was life that was brought from it. You know, years ago, um, you know, my my son Ezra is, a, is is 10 years old, and the morning um, that he was going to be born uh, later on in that day, that morning I found out that one of my good friends had, had taken his life. And whenever we get around that, that season of, you know, Ezra's birthday, it really is always joined with that death and the sadness that came through that. But yet God was so faithful and so good to sort of transition the thought of death with the reality of life. And what made that reality of life so special and so overwhelming to me was because I had experienced the other side of, of the emotion of death. And that really is a reality for, for you and I this morning. Um, and so, you know, although the way that we are doing this resurrection, this Easter service is, is different, um, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I'm, I'm glad we're here because life can be very frustrating. We, we've seen that. Life can be very limiting sometimes. At the same time, too, you know, I want to talk... And I want to walk through how Jesus can give us a fresh start, a fresh start in your marriage, a fresh start in your relationships, a fresh start in your career or your emotions, no matter where you are. This thing's not working. No matter where we are at all today. And so I want to begin with a word of prayer because I very easily can get in the way and I don't want to do that so um, let us start off with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you so much for calling each one of us. Um, and I thank you for the word that you've given to us or that you've spoken life to us. And I just ask for a new insight to be able to see um, this message of hope that we have on this morning of resurrection. And wherever we are, Lord, whether we're alone in our living room or on our phone, Lord, or whether we're with our families in living rooms or dens or basements, wherever the case is, Lord, um, that you desire to be with us. And so we ask, Lord, even now that your spirit would move among us, that it would teach us and that it would guide us this morning. And again, we ask all this in Jesus' name. All right. So this morning, again, I want to look at John. There are four narratives four Gospels, we would say, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And today I want to look at John because there's a difference in, in each in each one of those. And again, people will walk through the Gospels sometimes and they'll say, why are they so different? But I always think of it kind of like our kids. You know, years ago, 
we were speaking to our kids about jobs and responsibilities, and we said, well, what, you know, in order to have a living, in order to be able to take care of your families, what would you want to do? And Caleb said, well, I think I want to be an engineer. Um, you know, Genesis said, oh, I think, you know, I want to be a mom, and I want to own a bakery, and I want to sing. And I was like, man, that's awesome. You know, Ezra said, I want to be a pastor. And little Zeph at the time, this is a few years ago, Zeph looks at us and he says, Daddy? And I said, yeah, he said, I want to be a Mexican wrestler. And I was like, my, my dreams come true, you know, lucha libre. And so we're trying to think. And then after about half an hour, he looks at me and he says, or I want to be a clock or an elephant. Now, here's the thing. All different, all different ways, they were all still trying to transition to the way to look at taking responsibility of, of getting a job one day. And so... John writes a little bit different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke because he wants to share something. John is older at this time, so he's lived a long life. And so he's walking through this. And if you want to look through again, we're going to be looking at John chapter 20. It says this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. Now, some of your translations might say nighttime. It is early, early in the morning. Certainly not a safe place to be for her early in the morning. Certainly, as we're going to walk through the story, not a place where you want to be. I mean, I can't think about, you know, cruising or having a nice stroll in the cemetery at night. That doesn't sound <laughs> encouraging to me at all. But we find Mary Magdalene out there. And it says, and saw the tomb that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she's there, she finds out, um, and yes, you know, we're, we're finding that the stone is rolled away. We're saying yes, because we know the rest of the story. Remember, she had never read chapter 20 before. So she didn't know what was, what was going on. Um, she hadn't heard this story before. This is her first Easter. So she's hearing this for the first time, and she's concerned now because she has concern that somebody stole the body of Jesus. And here's the reality of the story. The question is why? Because dead people don't get up. And she had never seen that. Dead people don't move. You know, there's no zombie apocalypse societies. Well, maybe there are now. But um, there, there wasn't at all back then. Dead people don't get up. So verse 2 says, Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, who was John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So these guys get out again. This is where there's always a bit of authenticity for me in, in these sort of details. Because the tomb is empty, there's a missing body, there's two guys running, and only guys are going to say, hey, but I beat this other guy. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be a race. John is saying, hey, Peter was the rock. We're going to find out here in verse 4. Peter's the rock, but I was the runner. I also think John is 90 plus years old. There's probably some, like, oh, I remember back when I could run. And I could even, I could even beat Peter back then. Verse 4, he says, so they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter, right? Typical guy. And they came to the tomb, and he came to the tomb first. And he, stooping in and looking in, saw the linen lying there, yet he did not go in. So John stops there at the tomb, looks in, he perceives, doesn't go in. Simon Peter came, remember Simon Peter, ready, fire, aim, Peter, following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, that's Christ's head, not laying with the linen clothes, but folded together in its place by itself. So now... Here's the parental side of this, right? Parents, when our I mean, our kids, we woke them up, we let them sleep in a little bit, but waking them up and trying to get them to, to clean or to make their bed, this is always the one I want to give to my kids. Jesus was in the tomb and he still made his bed. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's there are some details here, though, that something is is off. John looks in and he sees something is off. Peter looks at what runs in and he realizes something is off. There's a sign again that something is off because when people break into something, whether somebody breaks into your house or here the tomb, something would be off because people don't organize things, right? They don't break in and steal your TV and say, you know what, let's do some laundry and some dishes. 
you can always tell something's a little bit off. Years ago, I must have been 15 or 16 years old, unbeliever. Um, my mom signed all of those guys in my family out for promise keepers. And so we went out to the big auditorium and we were there all day. And, and uh, you know, whether it was conviction or regret or whatever, I didn't really want to hear the message. And I remember telling my dad and brother, I'm just going to go and I'm going to go hang out by the concessions. And I found my way there. And these guys walked up to me finally and they said, hey, would you like a free drink? And being a middle child, being recognized was, was pretty cool. And I was like, yes, I would love a free drink. And then they said, well, they sat down next to me. Hey, how are you? I'm doing all right. I said, hey, would you like some nachos? Uh, yeah, sure. So sit there and they said, hey, um, would you mind signing this for me? Now, at that point, all of a sudden, I started realizing something's not right here. Because the free food, the free drink, that's okay, people talking. But why do they want me to sign something? It started getting really weird. And then a group of people came and they said, hey, can we have our picture with you? And I started thinking something is not right. Now, at that time, I had like long sort of wannabe dreaded hair, and I found out that this was a group of, of Rastafarian guys, and they were there, and they had this picture, and it looked, it truly did look just like me. And so they thought that I was Jesus checking out Promise Keepers. So they were trying to do their best. They were there, and they're like, he looks a little bit different, but this must be him. Let's get him a Coke. Let's get him some nachos. Let's get his autograph. I mean, wouldn't you get Jesus' autograph if he showed up? So there, but I could tell that something was off. And Peter realizes that something's off. Again, if they've stolen Jesus' body, why would they go into all the trouble of organizing this? He sees that something has been folded. Verse 8 tells us, it says, Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first, so there it is again, John reliving those glory days, right, when he could run, went in also, and he saw and believed. Now, I have that underlined in my Bible because John goes from doubter to believer. He's the first one. He's the first disciple to believe. Um, and I want you to notice as, as we read through all of the Gospels, you know, as you read through them on your own, you'll notice that every one of those disciples believed at a different time, believed at a different opportunity. Um, all the disciples believed in different orders and in their own time. And again, my prayer is as we walk through this this morning, I know that there are some of us that that know the Lord and we're excited. Again, my phone was going off nonstop this morning with, he is risen, happy resurrection, happy Easter. And then I know there's a group of us that maybe you're there because you miss being with people and your grandma or your parents have called you and said, if you come watch this hippie guy, then we promise you a free meal. I know some of you maybe scrolled onto this because you thought it was something else. And so there, there are different times, but the light bulb here goes on for John. And that really is my prayer for each one of us. The light bulb would, would go on because he's the first one to come out of darkness into light. It says, and for verse nine, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And the disciples went away again to their own homes. So again, understand this. All four Gospels say this, that no one expected Jesus to rise from the dead. Why? Because when you're dead, you are dead. There is no moving. There's no working. So here, the good news about Jesus, you know, even when people die, the fact that it is not over. My wife and I were talking about this the other day. Um, you know, I had read a story years ago, um, and it's one of my favorite stories about a Christian pastor who was, who was pastoring. Um, during the time of, of the Nazis, and he was killed days, you know, at the most a week before the Allies would come in and free people from the camps. And his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he was executed, but he t it was targeted because from the very beginning, he preached against Hitler and that message of hate. And so from the very beginning, they had a target put upon him. He said, this isn't right, this isn't good. And before he was executed, this is what he said. He said, this may be my end, yet it will be the beginning of all things. Because his hope, again, wasn't just in this life, but something that was to come. And um, those were his last words, because those who believe in Christ, even though we die, we still live. 
But here all the gospel writers are very clear. None of them expected this to happen. A few years ago, we looked at the disciples on the way to Emmaus. And Jesus says, why are you guys so down? You know, what's going on? And they're like, are you the only guy in Jerusalem who doesn't know about this Jesus guy and what happened? We had thought. Past tense. We had thought. So none of the disciples here know this. Now here's what I want to zone in here in verse 11. It says, but Mary stood outside of the tomb weeping literally sobbing and convulsing. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked inside the tomb. Now, I, I think, again, the reality of the story, um, why did she stoop in and look in? I think because she thought guys can miss something, especially when you have the young guy like John, who's more proud about, you know, I just imagine John and Peter running. He's like, hey, I'm faster than you. And he finally gets there. You know, here's Peter. <laughs> And he finally gets to the tomb. He runs in. He sees things folded. They leave. She probably thinks these guys have missed something, right? And I know that's how it is in my, my house. We go through this all the time, unfortunately. My wife will say, can you go in the pantry um, and, and go, grab me, uh, go grab me some pasta? And I'll walk in there and I'll say, where is it? It's between the almond flour and the pickles, I don't see it. It's on the second shelf between the almond flour and the pickles. It's not here. Julian said, I just put, it's not here. It's in a big red jug. No, it's not here. She'll walk over down the hall, go into the pantry, and then I'll hear, Julian, it's right here. Well, it wasn't there when I was there. It's a miracle. <laughs> it's just been put there. So I think that she probably thought these guys missed something. These guys have missed something. She wants to be able to see it for herself. Verse 12 says, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Notice she doesn't say, whoa, you guys are super shiny, bedazzled, I've never talked to angels before. She goes straight into dialogue, like she's not even affected by this. But she doesn't believe either. And again, she'd never read this chapter She'd never read any of the other Gospels. In her mind, last time she had seen Jesus, he was bruised, he was beaten, he was bloody, he was scourged, he was crucified, he was dead. Maybe she had seen them take down the body of Christ. And that's the image of Christ that she has in her mind. And here's the thing. She thinks that nobody, that not only have they taken his life, but they've taken all sort of dignity and honor away from his death. And that overwhelms her. And she's not taken by how glittery and how shiny the angels are, but she's like, if you guys have, you know, they've, they've done this, they've, they've taken this body away. This is verse 14. It says, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And I've gone through this many, many times. And I, you know, the other day I was walking through this just thinking because, yeah, I think she was overwhelmed with grief. She had tears in her eyes. She wasn't expecting to see Jesus. But I think the other reason why she didn't recognize him was because dead people don't move around. She never expected to see Jesus. And it's almost sort of comical here. I imagine Jesus having this dialogue with her with a smile. It says, and Jesus said to her, verse 15, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she supposing him to be the gardener. He says, hey, who are you looking for? And she thinks he's the gardener. Um, and I think, man, what's, what is that all about? Because again, most, most of us, we can say are on one of two camps. We either know who Jesus Christ is or we don't. And some of us think, yeah, Jesus was a great teacher or he was a guru, but, you know, there really is a reality to who Jesus was. And it's been said, you know, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or he was Lord and the Son of God. So she's there. You know, you can't call him a good teacher if he's a liar, if he's giving false hope, if he's speaking false life. You know, who do you say he is? And that really starts this narrative for you and I this morning is who do I say Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? 
you know, in our society, many of us know more about the Game of Thrones than who sits on the throne is kind of the reality. And who really is Jesus? And that is so important. Because just as spring will eventually come, and not anytime soon apparently, but as it will eventually come here in the Bitterroot, so Jesus too is coming back. And it is so important for us to know who he is. Now notice the rest of this conversation. She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She says, hey, don't worry, I'm not going to call the cops. I'm not going to report you. I'm not going to make a scene. It's actually emphatic here. I myself, I'll take his body wrapped up, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Now, I think there's something about the way that Jesus said that. Maybe she had a nickname. Maybe he said, Mayor, come on. But I think there's also something else. Have you ever had somebody call your name when you didn't expect it and it it caught you off guard? You know, when Laura and I were first married, um, we'd just gotten off the mission field and and I remember I was going up to, we were getting married in in her hometown and, and as I made my way up there, the first full day that I was there, I was walking down the road and somebody said, hey, Julian. And I looked over and I'm like, hey. And I wasn't expecting it. And you know when, when somebody calls your name but you don't know who they are, so you kind of act like you're actually looking at something else or thinking about something else. You know, you're trying to act like you don't have their attention. Maybe not you, your neighbor. Um, but in the midst of all of this, um, you know, I finally, they, were, they walked up to me, Julian, Julian. And I was like, do I, you know, you try to act like you're trying to remember, do I know this person at all? And I said, do I, do I know you? And they're like, oh, you're, you're Dave and Helen's soon-to-be son-in-law, aren't you? Yeah. Have we met before? Oh, no, I just, I heard that there was this guy that just got back from Nepal, and he was going to be marrying, you know, their daughter, and then he was kind of scruffy, and he was kind of darker, and I was like, oh, okay, I, 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 I fit that, um, it was crazy though. There, were, there was something about it. Now imagine this. Imagine you're Mary. You're overwhelmed with grief, with sorrow. It's early and dark in the morning. And all of a sudden, you're emotional. You're stressed out, and some gardener knows your name. So it's a little bit creepy here. It's a little bit freaky. Imagine you're walking in the park downtown, you know, and all of a sudden it's early in the morning. It's five in the morning. And it's still dark, and some, you know, one of the guys that's out there you know, trimming bushes comes up to you and he's like, hey, Fred, what's up? It'd be kind of freaky. So I, I, that is sort of the narrative that's going on. Jesus says to her, Mary, she turned to him and said, Rabboni, that is to say, teacher. It's a term of in, endearment. She'll say, you know, it's almost like she's saying, Jesus, is, is that you? And listen, here is what it takes for us to be saved is you and I need to hear Jesus calling out to us, calling our names. Um, Many of us, sometimes we'll think that we chose Jesus, but he chose us. He was never lost. You know, when we say, and I know what we mean when we say we found Jesus, but he was the one that was searching and and looking for us. Jesus was, was never lost at all. He is there and, and he calls out Mary's name and, and gets her attention here. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Now, some of your translations might say, do not touch me. Do not cling to me is a better translation. Do not touch me. Sometimes we read that and it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense because he will go up to Thomas and say, hey, Thomas, put your fingers in the holes in my hands and the hole in my side. That same morning in Luke, we're told that Jesus goes to his disciples and he says, handle and see me. So he's not prohibiting her from touching his resurrected body, which I know some people have said, you know, saying, oh, you're a sinner and I'm perfect, so don't touch me. Because we're still sinners and Jesus is still perfect. So there's something else here. He says, do not cling to me. Remember he told his disciples, it's not expedient or it's expedient that I leave, that my spirit would come. And here she says, Rabbi, my teacher. And he says, don't cling to me. The tense is stop clinging to me. We would probably say, hey, stop holding on. This is what was happening. She saw and recognized Jesus. 
And she put the death grip upon Jesus. And she said, I'm never going to let you go ever again. And I'm sure Jesus was kind of like, Mary, Mary, come on. Don't, don't cling to me here. Um, and again, one aspect of spiritual experiences is we're not meant to, to stay there. We're meant to take that experience and share it with others. Um, because God, you know, doesn't want you to just have a moment. He wants you to be able to have a mission. And that's what he's going to give here to Mary. It says, but go to my brethren and say to them, I, have, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So go tell the family. Now there's access. Now there's community. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but friends and brothers, brothers and sisters. Something now has been restored. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she, and he had spoken these things to her. The tense is that she kept telling them. The idea is she had seen something and she couldn't get it off her mind. Something that was seared, a lasting thought in her mind. Now here's what I think I need to hear this morning. What I think the Lord would share with each one of us is I believe some of us need need a fresh start and it doesn't matter if you know the Lord, if you don't know the Lord, if you've been raised in church, if you've never been to church, if you can't spell the word church, um, it doesn't matter where you are because listen to me, Jesus gives us a fresh start. And I want you to know something about, about Mary because this is not the person that we would probably pick to be a messenger. You know, Luke tells us that she... She was a woman um, that had seven demons within her. People would have said, you know, and she lived with that stigma, whether it was with her family and people around her for probably for outside of the church for a lot of years. It would have been easy for people to say, you're just nuts. You're the lady that had seven demons, aren't you? And yet Jesus gave her this message. And I heard one guy say that she was tore up from the floor up. <laughs> um, that's for you millennials uh, but that's the reality like when it come to when it came to her family situation it was messed up when it came to emotional stuff she had been scarred and abused and messed up when it came to understanding and, and the way that people saw her things were messed up and I know that is some of us this morning some of us are coming this morning and we're messed up because we found ourselves in a certain way Hear that message that Jesus gave to Mary here. Because although she was messed up, he took her and he transformed her. And he set her free. And the first messenger that Jesus sends out is this woman. This one that was dedicated, that realized that the only life that she truly had had come from Jesus Christ. And if Jesus can give her a fresh start and a new start and a new identity and new history, he can do the same thing for you and I. You know, uh, a couple days ago, I watched this documentary. When I can't sleep, I watch documentaries. And I watched this documentary called uh, Free Solo. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. It's about free climbing. So climbing without any harnesses or ropes or blades at all. Um, and I'm not a big heights fan. You know, because the word says, lo, I am with you. Amen. So I don't try to go high. Um, but, I, but I was watching this in the middle of the night. And the, and the thing that was amazing about the free climbing here was this guy was going to climb El Capitan in Yosemite uh, without any ropes or harnesses at all. Now, El Capitan um, is 3,200 feet. It's 3,200 feet of granite. And, you know, it took him just about four hours and what was interesting is all throughout the documentary, they have interviews with family and friends and other free climbers. And at the very beginning of it, they're all really stoked and really excited for him. And it gets closer and closer to that day. And then the day of, there is high emotion here. Because they realize that it's unlike any other sort of sport that, that we have. Or you can go and you can lose at a basketball game. You can go have a bad golf game or a soccer game or whatever the case is, and you can still come home alive. But if he makes a mistake, he doesn't come home. You have to be perfect at all things, 3,200 feet. 
And what's unthinkable is, again, he did it just under four hours. Um, what's interesting to me, if you took, you know, you don't know, again, how long it takes to climb El Capitan. Four hours is really fast, especially with no ropes. But somebody very smarter than me had made a comment about it, um, whether it was something I was watching later or, or I can't remember during the documentary, but they said it took four hours, but it only takes at that height and at that weight, it only takes 15 seconds to hit the ground. So what does that mean? It's real easy to mess things up very quickly. And you can work, and I'm speaking from experience, you could work your whole life on something and then in an instant bring devastation because it's easier to gain momentum falling than it is climbing. And that's what had happened to Mary. She had been falling and Christ came and he lifted her up and he gives her a new identity, a new hope, a new history, a new outcome. And again, that's why Jesus is here for each one of us. That's why it's called the good news. Salvation is not about us trying to climb our way to heaven at all, but about what he has already done, about God coming down. Paul says this to the church in Rome, Romans 5, 9, he says, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. One thing about Christianity that's hard for some of us um, to get hold of is the reality of it. And it comes from us being real. God looking at us, you know, yes, God loves us, but God loves us enough that he doesn't want us to stay where, where he found us. God loves you where you are, but he's not called you to stay where you are. He's called each one of us to pick up our cross and follow, follow him. And not only that, but he wants to break through what's been holding us back. You know, Mary is there, she's weeping, and Jesus comes to her, and he says, are you okay? Jesus wanted to bring a breakthrough for her. You know, many of the Many of us battle things that we feel like, you know, we read the word and we say, oh, we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, but then we try to do it on our own and we think, I, I can't conquer this, I can't overcome this. But that's because the victory is his. And he wants to heal that hurt. He wants to be able to have that sort of breakthrough in our lives. Jesus broke through death that you and I would be able to have life. And so listen, some of us I know, they've been hurt, abused, used, or wounded, but he came to bring life and care to each one of us. So in the same way that maybe your story this morning has started off in darkness, it can end in light. In the same way that Mary came and she came in the dark and it ended in light. And I love this scene because, you know, if you read the rest of the narratives and you go through and I encourage you to do that, that first morning Jesus is calling out his purchase bride. The first thing that Jesus does in being resurrected is he goes and he collects you and I. He collects those that are broken like Mary. He collects those that are hopeless, hopeless like the ones on the way to Emmaus we had hoped. He goes and he collects Peter. You know, in that day that he had appeared to Peter, the denier, um, you know, come a week later, he'll collect Thomas, the doubter. And I love that he does that in a very personal way, that his desire this morning is to call each one of us to himself. Again, that, that is the good news. You know, the, the word evangelism that we get again comes from the soap merchants. You know, before they had Old Spice or Axe, if anybody actually uses Axe, we'll be praying for you. Um, or Calvin Klein or, or whatever the case is, soap was a very important commodity. It should be still today, right? But you would have soap merchants going around the town and they would spread, they would be a called evangelists and they'd be sharing the good news. The good news was you can be cleansed from the stench. It doesn't need to be this way anymore. You can move and you can work through that. And so my prayer for you, um, you know, we have a, a, a little video here from Matt that Matt wants to send out to, to the youth and to everybody else. Um, and then Michelle is gonna do an activity with the Sunday school and then we'll all meet back together here and we'll, we'll do one more song together. But um, my, my prayer is that, that this morning, and that's what I want to be praying for you, that, that this morning as we look at 
not only the Lord's death, but especially his resurrection, that he wants for you and I, he wants that breakthrough. And so whatever it is that's been holding you back, whether it's it's history, whether it's drama, maybe you're raised in the church and you have such a, a warped view of who Jesus is. Maybe you're like Mary, you think Jesus is the gardener. You think he's just somebody that fixes the garden and makes things look good. There's more to that. And what he wants for you and I it really is a blessing, but it comes to us not being fake anymore. You know, looking looking to him. You know, I, I texted Joe Claxton this morning, and I'll share this story here. We, we had been talking about different, different avenues to do certain services, and we had been talking about doing one outdoors. And he texted me this morning, and he was like, wow, it would have been really cool this morning. And I texted back, yeah, I agree. And I said, but maybe next year in Jerusalem. You know, for all we know, Resurrection 2020, this will be our last resurrection service that we have here on earth. And I truly do believe that the Lord is coming back quickly and not because I'm reading the news, but because I'm reading this. There's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's earthquakes, there's divisions. Our hope is being put in so many different things. Our, our hope and our security is put in things that, that we realize now can be taken away so easily. And not only that, but we're putting our hope in somebody's hands who can't control that. Christ is the only one that controls that. He's the one that holds this whole world together. So I, I want to pray, and then we've got a short message here from Matt, and then Michelle is going to, parents, you guys can go get lunch ready, and we're going to have a, something for the Sunday school and activity, and then we'll all meet back here afterwards, and we will um, sing one more song together. Amen. So Lord, just thank you again for your goodness and for your grace. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be able to to be here and to be able to be your family. And um, I just want to lift up those that I know I need a fresh start daily. I know how many times I am just so overcome with things that I can't see clearly. Lord, and I know that you came that not only would we see you clearly, we'd hear you call our voice in the same way you called Mary's voice. Lord, in the same way that Sometimes our perception of who you are or what you want from us, Lord, not realizing that you want everything for us, can be so skewed. And so, Lord, may this be the day that we choose to hand over to you what you created, this life. Lord, again, you said that you come that we'd have life, life more abundantly. Lord, you came that we would have life, real life. And so as we celebrate this morning, Lord, whether again in our living rooms with family or friends or whether it's by ourselves, Lord, we know that there is one thing that continually connects us and that's this family that you've given to us. Being washed in your blood, being purchased, Lord, by your son. Lord, may that be our mindset and as this big ball of dirt continues to rotate, Lord, we ask that you would Allow us to be able to not just stay where we are, Lord, but um, stay in that moment, but send us out on a mission where you'd have us. And whether that's loving our wives or our husbands or our kids or our coworkers, being a light at the grocery store, or allowing you to move and work. And again, we thank you so much for the work that you've accomplished for each one of us that we would have hope that we would be able to have a fresh start, Lord, that you've given us a new history and a new destiny. We ask you to be blessed and glorified. And again, we ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, I'm gonna play high tech now, the video from Matt <laughs> off of my phone for you. And then Michelle's gonna get organized for the Sunday school. So you guys get ready for Sunday school. Here he is. You see that? No. 
it's smaller this way. Like kind of <laughs> over here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Roots Youth. Happy Easter. He is risen. Uh, I just wanted to share a quick message saying that I hope that uh, this high tech message here finds you and your family doing well and celebrating our risen Savior and thinking about other ways that we can celebrate this resurrection in our lives uh, tomorrow and every day forth until we are uh, with Him one day. Uh, until that moment, I, again, I just wanted to share a few things. One, thank you so much for those of you who sent your praises in to me. I've been praying through those, and it's been very uh, inspiring and encouraging to me to see how God has been faithful uh, to you during this time. And so I wanted to let you know that I will be posting those this afternoon um, on Instagram and also text them out through the Remind text app so that way everyone can be praying for each other but also just seeing in the different ways uh, that God has been faithful just in our youth group, knowing that God is faithful to his children all around the world. Um, so thank you for that. Keep uh, Stay in touch, stay in tune for other updates and activities coming out through the Remind text thing. We've got some more stuff coming out through the week. Uh, but above, above everything, I just wanted to say... Uh, during this season, especially as we move forward, I want to be as available for you as you as humanly possible. Uh, so, with that being said, if you have any questions, if you have, if you want to have a conversation or talk about life or whatever it might be, or even just you know, pass forth some some terrible jokes, please reach out. <laughs> I want to be I want to be there for you and answer uh, your questions and uh, just still be in your life as as best I can. Uh, so, happy Easter! Uh, I hope this again is is finding you doing very well. Um, and with that. Uh, I look forward to, to being in touch with you soon and talking to you very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs> yes. Use your inside voice, talk loud. My inside outside voice? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, are we good? Okay, good morning everybody. I'm Michelle Galante, um, Sunday School Director. I have my good friend Ezra here. He's going to help me out with what we're going to talk about today. Um, before I get started though, I wanted to just go over some ways that um, Sunday School families and uh, kids can be involved and connected during this time where we are not meeting regularly at the church building. So we have um, a Facebook page and it is called Roots Seedling Sunday School. So you can go and like that page and I make announcements there and um, I post challenges there as well or I have at least once. <laughs> I'll do more. I also send out a newsletter to all of the families who have been coming to Sunday School. If you have not got that newsletter and you would like to, then you can find my contact information on the Facebook page and you can send me an email or a text. Um, you can also, I'll give you my phone number, it's 406-370-8236. Um, again, 406-370-8236. Um, we did have a challenge this past week where I challenged the kids to finish up with the memory verse that we had been working on prior to um, COVID-19, and so I said if anybody could text me a video or an audio recording or call me and say 2 Chronicles 7.14 that I would send out a surprise. So I did have some kids that I wanted to congratulate for doing that. So very well done goes to Leland, Josephine, Landon, Alila, Ezra, <laughs> and Susanna, and Joseph, and Iris, and Claire, Ivory, Emily, Daniel and Bradley. And I do believe I got everybody there. So good job, everybody. Eric mailed out your surprises for me yesterday. You should be getting them soon. So, um, and I'll have another challenge for you coming this week. Okay, so before we get started or get really into what we're doing, and before I really start talking to you a lot, or some, um, I just want to share a little bit. Um, Easter Resurrection Day is actually... Um, Super special for me personally because years ago, probably Ezra would say back in the 1900s, mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> um, I was teaching Sunday school to four and five year olds. And um, I was a believer, which is good because I was teaching Sunday school. 
Um, and um, I was a believer, but something happened that day, and I'll never forget that day because as I was telling those four and five year olds all about Jesus dying on the cross to save them, and I was really gearing it all towards what Jesus had done for them, it fell afresh on me what he had done for me. And it changed the entire course of my life that day teaching Sunday school. I had been working a really fancy job in Los Angeles. And it was just from that day forward, the Lord called me into teaching. I went, I came to Montana and got my teaching degree. And um, it changed the course of everything in my life, how he took hold of my life afresh that day. And um, so I, I really appreciated especially what Julian was said today. We did not plan that, like his message for Mary. I felt like I had a similar message from the Lord that day on Easter. And so it's really special to me to um, be able to come before you and share about the gospel message today. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use um, a tea bag, and we're going to talk about Jesus' death and resurrection. So here's our tea bag. I hope you can kind of see it from there. Um, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to take off this part right here. Will you hold that for me, please? Okay. So this right here is the label. This identifies um, what kind of tea bag this is. Um, and so this label identifies tea. Jesus had many names and labels. Can you think of any names that Jesus was called? Uh, Yahweh, I am, Messiah, Jesus. <laughs> so we have Yahweh, I am, Jesus, Messiah, and then when Jesus was placed on the cross, do you remember, do you know what was written over his head on the cross? Do you know the name that he was given there? Do you remember that? I do, but my mind is blank. Okay, that can happen behind the camera, trust me. Um, King of the Jews, so that was another name, and he, he was called Friend of Sinners, um, but the thing is, is that Jesus, from everything I've read, he wasn't really concerned about having a special title or a special label. Um, he did not consider um, that being equal with God was something that should be grasped for him. Instead, he took on the nature of a servant. He came and lived and walked on this earth as a servant and um, emptied out himself and made himself nothing. Okay, can I borrow that again? Okay, so here we have this part of the tea bag, and that's the string. And so the string is attached, you can see. Um, it's attached to the tea bag. And um, people here on earth, or I'm gonna give it back to you. People here on earth are attached to a lot of things. We're attached to possessions. Um, we're attached to pleasure. We're attached to power. And kids, you may have seen even recently how attached we are to certain luxuries and or things that we didn't think were luxuries have become some luxuries recently. And, you know, Jesus ended up being tempted by Satan in the desert. Satan tried to get him with these sorts of same attachments with possessions and pleasure and offering all these things to him. But that wasn't Jesus' focus. He wasn't attached. So, let me give it back thing. So he was not attached, so therefore we can cut the string. Okay, and Jesus, he came also to free us from being attached to those things. And then now I want to talk about, and it's probably hard to see from there, but there is a tiny staple. You can see the tea can't come out, thank you, <laughs> um, of this tea bag because it is stapled closed. So this tea bag was pierced by that staple. It has holes because of this staple. But Jesus wasn't pierced with a staple. What was he pierced with? <laughs> with nails and a spear and he was actually put on the cross he was nailed to the cross right so um i'm gonna just remove that staple right here okay now what's inside of here well you know what's inside of here what does it look like grains of tea looks like grains of tea right mm -hmm. if you didn't know this was tea what might you think it is should I dump it in here so you can see it better? Um, dirt. Okay. So it looks like dirt. Um, if you put this in water, 
What will happen? You want to hold that for me? Butter. What happens if we put water in there? It turns into tea. It turns into tea. <laughs> what color does it turn into? Brown. Right. The water turns it brown, and it's no longer clear and pure. So you can't see through this, but I do, and hopefully it is hot. I have water in here, and I'm going to hopefully not spill. And I hope it's not too hot for your hands. But the water has... <laughs> has turned it, yeah, can you swirl it maybe? The water now is not clear and pure, and that's what sin does in our lives. The dirt in the tea bag is like the sin in our lives. But, um, so we're not pure, and we weren't born pure, but that's why Jesus came, to help us remove this sin from our lives. And if we ask him into our heart, and we ask him for forgiveness, he will do that. He washes us as white as the snow that you see out on the ground today, that we... Maybe we're surprised to see, but here it is, and it's beautiful. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to take that, okay. and we're going to trade here. Okay. All right, so can you hold that? All right, so here is the empty tea bag now, and I think we can get it to open up and kind of stand up here. Maybe you could help it stand. There we go. So there's the tea bag. When Jesus removed sin from our lives, then we're pure. We can be proud in the sight of the Lord. Um, and we can become a light for God. Philippians 2.15 says that among the perverse generation, we will shine as lights in the world. So Jesus was a light um, when he lived here on the earth. And just like our dirty, or well, it's, it's lovely tea, but it looks dirty, uh, just like that water. Um, where sin is, that's where darkness is, but where Jesus is, that's where light is. So Jesus died on the cross on Friday, on Good Friday, and there was darkness, but then on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Day, he rose from the dead, and there was light. Okay, are you ready? I'm so ready. Okay, so here is light. So Jesus became a light, and he rose <laughs> into heaven. And one day, it's off camera, but it's coming back down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jesus will return, and he will come back to us. And so this really right here is the story of Easter. This is what the Lord did for us in our lives. And I just um, I want to read to you from Ephesians 2. Um, 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in I just lost my place. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that word workmanship, that is a word that means like God designed us. He created as a piece of artwork. He created us as, as a special poem, something that he designed each one of us specifically in a special way. And so I just want to put before you, if you haven't asked God into your heart, is today the day? Will today be the special day that you remember? Um, will it be a day that you recommit your life to the Lord if you've already asked him into your heart? And maybe you don't know how to do how to ask him into your heart. It's as simple as just saying, Praying to him and saying, God, I, I, Jesus, I have sinned. I am a sinner. And I want you to come live in my heart and forgive me of my sins. And I want to live my life for you. So kids, if you haven't done that, I just encourage you, pray with your parents. Parents, pray with your kids. And if you've done that, just think of ways that, if you've already done that, then um, think of ways that you continue can continue to live your life for the Lord. This will be a memorable Easter because... <laughs> We've never quite had an Easter like this, 
But I just, my prayer is that it's even more memorable between you and your relationship with the Lord and all that he has done um, for you and for me. So thank you for helping me. You're very all right. Well, let's pray. And after we pray, then the worship team will come and um, we'll get to close our time together out in song. Lord God, I just thank you so much for this beautiful day. Jesus, I thank you for the amazing sacrifice that you made for all of us, that you care so deeply for us, that you want to be in relationship with us, and that you want to just fill us, fill us with your spirit and guide us in all that you have for us. We thank you for this day. I pray that you would bless everybody that is hearing this message, that they would be touched by you and this word. We just give you this day. We give you the glory. In your name I pray. Amen. So we're going to try a little bit of harmonica this morning, uh, the last minute decision, um, but we're going to see if we can do this together. Your love is a great
Love you all. Looking forward to doing this together soon. God is good. Amen. We will see you guys next week.